And the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Sheila Bijiwe, has come to the defense of the government in regard to the country's current national debt position, which some argues is unsustainable. Bijiwe says Kenya needs to invest heavily at this point in time in order to provide a suitable environment for its youthful population to thrive and repay the debt in future. She was speaking during a breakfast meeting organized by the Business Daily, bringing together investors, industry, captains and staff from the Nation Media Group. Look at 2012, we were at 41%. Look at 2016, we were at 50%. Uh, 50%. The acceptable number for an emerging uh, population is around 50, 50%. So we are already at what you'd call uh, the ceiling. But the trend is worrying and needs to be uh, addressed. 77% um, debt to GDP ratio in the year 2000. Um, we're about 55, 54 now. Um, you know, I always look at uh, Kenya like a, a young adult. Um, you've come through a certain stage of development and you've reached a stage now where you have 60% of your population below 30, 30 odd years. And so if you don't invest now, if you don't create opportunities now, then what is going to happen? Um, you have to take some risk if you want to move forward. And of course, we want to also hear from our panelists this morning of, on this developing story of the Kenya debt burden. Remember, also today is a big day for Kenya. Of course, we'll be having the East African region reading the budget estimates, not only in Kenya, but also in Tanzania, Uganda, and elsewhere in East Africa as well. As Ali had introduced to you our guest, of course, they're here in the studio. We'd like to just pick their minds on this particular developing story on the Kenya debt burden as well. So we have conflicting suggestions from the the, the CEO of Cyton Investment and also the Deputy uh, Governor of Central Bank as well in regard to Kenya's debt burden, burden, I should say. And also, earlier, we had read a story for you on Emma Kiba, a huge success that Kenyans have been eagerly awaiting for. Now, let's hear from uh, Mike Eldon, first of all, uh, especially on the Kenya, Kenya debt burden. Of course, we've been having this state of economy and we've been discussing Kenya debt burden. All of you, you've been having variegated views on how the Kenya debt burden is sustainable or is not sustainable. So which way? We are on a horn of dilemma here, right? We have the central bank uh, deputy governor saying we are okay. We have the site on investment saying no, no, no. We are actually tottering on the edge of a brink. Where are we? Uh, I was fortunate enough to be at this event yesterday morning. So I heard both these presentations and they were both very calm and thoughtful presentations, mm -hmm. I thought. And Sheila Mujiba kept referring to the fact that she was basing what she was saying only on facts. Mm -hmm. uh, there was um, uh, very much of an evidence-based approach to what she was saying and comparing Kenya to other countries. Yes. Uh, and even the... Um, the other speaker, the CEO of Saiton, mm -hmm. I think to say that he thought we were on the brink of a uh, disaster, whatever, th there was one sentence on that. But the whole th uh, thrust of what he was saying mm -hmm. was about how Kenya, of all sub-Saharan African countries, is still the preferred destination by far. And he quoted all sorts of reasons. He went on a great length about it. So both of these speakers were optimists mm -hmm. for Kenya. For me, um, this issue of debt, you can argue it either way, uh, that we are on the brink or that we're growing and therefore we need it and people are finding us credit worthy and therefore they're giving us the loans. But the question really is how we're using the debt. And we've talked about this on this panel before. Yes. Are we delivering value for money from what is being borrowed? Is it going to pay salaries and other recurring expenses, or is enough of it going, as Sheila Mbidiwa was calling for, and you heard in that clip there, for investing in the future for our children and grandchildren? Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is where the big questions are, and where, as we hear the budget today, and all the money that has to be found, how much of it will actually go to development? How much of it will go, for instance, 
to education. I'm very involved with this curriculum reform. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see, yes, there's a budget for education and for higher education and for this and that other aspect. I know from my dealings with the curriculum reform that it's more of a hand-to-mouth budget that they're dealing with for this extraordinary transformative initiative that if handled well and Im implemented as we hope it will be, of itself will do more than any loan and debt and whatnot. So value for money for me is the big it's question. A, it's a big question. Sustainability, I'll leave to techies in the financial field. All right. That. Okay, let's hear from Phyllis Wakiaga. Uh, hearing the, the governor, what will be your sentiments? Because also we had uh, the president uh, addressing the nation during the State of uh, Nation Address as well. And he alluded to the fact that also, we you know, we like 50% of the government expenditure or the GDP is actually going to the 2%. And largely that is uh, tracked away on wage bill. Hearing also that we are having this debt burden, first of all, that we borrow to, you know, plug the holes of other debts as well. Are we, as M Mike Eldon is saying, can you also hold with this view that it's truly it's a hand-to-mouth sort of budget that we have in this country? I think if we are looking at the budget, we must look at why we budget. Uh, we currently have the vision 2030. And the budget for this year is actually the bridge between the MTP2 and the MTP3, meaning that our budget should actually be carrying the agenda of economic transformation forward. Mm -hmm. The issue of expenditure is something that we can't run away from because if a lot of the budget is spent on recurrent expenditure, yes. that's not very positive because at the end of the day, is it leading to more job creation? Is it leading to stimulating uh, economic growth? Mm -hmm. So I agree with Mike that uh, we need to be very conscious about where this money is going. We had the five transformation agendas also under uh, the last four budgets around uh, creating a conducive business environment, job creation in, in certain sectors, issues of infrastructure development. If you see budget going into areas like that, that is a positive budget. The budget was also supposed to focus on the issue of social services and look at how devolution can deliver services to people. But if our budget is going towards salary, that would not be sustainable in the long term. <coughs> if you look at the budget deficit, we have a 2.6 trillion budget. 1.7 trillion is supposed to be uh, funded locally, so we have a deficit of close to 1 trillion. International best practice is to have a deficit about 4% of the GDP, yes. which is about probably 300, 400 uh, billion. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at those figures closely. How do we reduce the budget deficit? And it, it's really about reducing expenditure mm -hmm. in non-productive areas. Thank you. Yeah. We, we have this news or, or, or this particular study from uh, the Newsplex and also the Institute of Economic Affairs, the analysis reveals that the debt is growing faster than the economy and the debt to GDP ratio rose from 37% of GDP in 2011 to 2012 uh, to 42% of GDP in 2014-2015. This is a high debt to GDP ratio and also it may make it more difficult for, for the country to pay the debt and also could lead to creditors to seek high interest rates when lending. Of course, also that will be another uh, story that we'll talk about with the uh, uh, interest rates as well, because we've had also uh, the governor coming to the fore and complaining really about the capping of the interest rates. But do we really go back and say that that was a legislation that is truly affecting uh, you know, that particular sector? Ali Khan? The cap? Yes. Is it a disaster? The cap is a disaster. Yeah. Policy makers need to look at outcomes. Everyone's sincerity is not in question. But, but the outcome the is a debacle. We have completely cut off credit to the most vibrant part of our economy. I don't know what else we can look at in order for people to have the penny drop. Mm -hmm. But this is also a key part of being a small nation and policy making. You can't afford mistakes. We can't wait till after the election. But the argument, Ali, is before Which go government on. wants to go into an, uh, into an election in a recession, right? 200 basis points, possibly most of the forecasts I'm seeing from people I, I, I value, we're looking at a, a slowdown of 200 basis points on GDP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The day that number prints, you're going to be telling me where did this come from? This came from, it, it, it started beforehand, 
but it was accelerated by the interest rate cap. Now, we can go back and analyze the situation, but I can tell you, frankly, it's not working. There's no credit for the SME sector. No, but the, the argument is, and I read from my introduction, that mm. yes, the decline that we do have currently was there long before this particular capital it interest rate law came past, or was passed through parliament. It had started and it to was slow the down. Lowest, he says it was the lowest force, or it was the lowest at around 4% in September when the say the law came into force and has since marginally risen to 4.4%. I don't know where that data is coming from. It's, it's come down from about 15 months ago, private sector credit growth was around 20%. Okay, today it's about 4.4. It's slowed down 1,550 basis points. Fact, right? We can't change those facts. The point the fa is, we cannot shuffle blame on the capping rates. Well, where are you going to put the blame on? On that legislation, because it was that way even before. Well, it had started before, but capping rates compounded it, right? It's like, you know, it, 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 something is slowing down, you go and do something else which decelerates it further. You can't say these are disconnected, they're connected, <laughs> right? Or if, you, if you look at our economy, the economy, you know, take out the corporate sector, look at the SME sector, look at that, that whole component of the, of, of the economy, <laughs> Where is the credit coming from? This economy breathes on credit, right? If you have choked it off, you're, what, and we can sit here and argue and the banks are being recalcitrant and we can continue using this language. But the point is that the bank, which is sane bank, is going to lend money to people at 14% when it can lend to the government at 14%. Right? I mean, there is no bank manager who's sitting there who's going to go to his shareholders and say, hang on a second, no, no, we lent a bun bunch of cash to people at 14% in a couple of months' time. I, I'm not sure how, is, is it going to be impaired or not? This is insanity. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've worked in banking for 25 years. You'd, be, you'd lose your job. So this is a fact. You can't do it. You can't lend at rates which are not commensurate with the credit risk. And you can't force people to do that. Otherwise, we might as say, say we're a command economy and we're a bunch of communists. But the thing is, we're not. We're capitalists. And what we know right now mm. is that we have, we have choked off credit to the significant portion of the economy, right? I, I agree, 14% bucket loads of credit would have been wonderful, but it hasn't happened. Now, what are you going to do about it? How long are we going to discuss it for? We know what, what the outcomes are. We've, as policymakers, you've got to look at the outcome and say, look, the outcome is not what I wanted. Now what am I going to do? Right. So do, we, do, do you think also it is a, a, a very, you know, void point for us to really be channeling or and shuffling of blame to the lending uh, rates, the capping interest rates, the, the, the law itself? Polycarp. Uh, I want to build on that point with a different, uh, on a, with a different angle. Um, First of all, you're in mint condition, I can see. Oh, thank no, you so no, much. No, no, no bullet holes. <laughs> I saw that drama. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> thank God, but move, moving on. Moving on swiftly. Moving on to that. Um, I, I, I want to build on that point by saying, my greatest disappointment with Kenya's banking industry is how it lacks innovation. The Kenyan banking industry, to be honest with you, is orthodox. And... Um, I think government was sending them a signal to say, activate lending. Government's intent was activate, uh, activate the economy by making sure people have access to credit because the cost of credit was far too high. And, and we, let's not get lost on that point. Kenyans want to borrow, but they can't borrow at the spreads and margins the banks were enjoying. The margins were way too fat, what you call abnormal profits. I think in economics, we Super also normal. evil profits, <laughs> actually. <laughs> now, you can't do that, not to a young adult. Uh, you, banks should be banks, not Shylocks. So I am really a supporter of the interest cap. Um, and I think what should happen is that banks need to innovate new ways of being able to bring credit to the consumer, both as a corporate businessman as an individual. Um, and, and we are not seeing a lot of that, but thank God in the last two or so weeks, I've seen a lot of new companies, which even <laughs> banks don't know whether they exist, who are giving the credit. And now coming back to this issue of uh, government debt, um, I think we don't have a very high 
uh, GDP debt ratio. Uh, and I want to use Sheila Mbijiwe as the Deputy Governor of Central Bank's statement, where she, which was evidence-based. How can you be? Would you rather wait to take a mortgage when you're 60, or do you take a mortgage when you're 30? What is the best time to take a mortgage? When is the best time to borrow money to pick up insurance or start paying for pensions? Mm -hmm. We are a country with a population with a median age of 19.2, 19, 19 years old. If this country, we as a people, don't take risks of borrowing now to try and create security, infrastructure, macro stability, transformation in agriculture, transformation in tourism, we will be dead on arrival when we get to 2030 mm -hmm. because we'll have way too many young people out of jobs. And for me, if we are borrowing to put into segments and, and uh, sectors that create jobs, then I think even that debt should, ratio should go to 70. You go to European Union countries and America, their GDP to debt ratios, I would love the media to actually tell people what their GDP to debt ratios is. I think the issue we should be looking at is do we have capacity to pay back our debts. Yeah, that's a good question. Let's see, as we're taking, uh, bef uh, before we take a short break, I should say, in the budget review <coughs> outlook paper of 2015, the debt to GDP ratio was projected to reach 63% in the physical year 2018, 2019. And a study by World Bank found that if the debt to GDP ratio exceeds 64% in emerging markets, it slows economic growth by 2%. Where are we at? Because experts also are saying a higher debt to uh, GDP ratio is accept acceptable when an economy is growing faster before its future earnings will be able to pay off the debt more quickly and when a country has a viable plan to address the high ratio. Uh, Dibal, uh, give the, us a true picture. The true picture? Yes. Yes. What is the capacity to service the debt? And the correct number to be looking at is uh, what amount of what is our debt service in relation to what are our ex export earnings? Because you see, domestic debt, I mean, basically, as as Polycarp likes to say, uh, quantitative easing. I mean, you can print your own money. So the domestic debt is not really the big problem. The big problem is you if you've borrowed um, from elsewhere you have to make the money to pay for that debt, and that money is export earnings. Now, uh, so the real ceiling that you should be looking at, and if you look at the IMF uh, uh, estimation, is what is the percentage, what is the proportion of your debt service to your export earnings, and uh, emerging markets, 25% is the recommended ceiling. Now, right now, we are at 11%. So if you compare what is the amount of money we have to pay for our foreign debt service to our annual export earnings, the percentage is 11%. The recommended ceiling is 25%. Mm -hmm. Suggesting you have a headroom of more than, of about 14% mm -hmm. of additional debt service capacity. Mm -hmm. So. Um, now, is it fair to question, uh, is the debt uh, growing fast? I think all those questions are useful, but without a doubt, we are nowhere near a crisis point. Now, but we go back then to Mike Eldon's question, what are we doing with this money when we borrow it? And I think that that is a significant question, because if we agree with Polycarp and Sheila that we better borrow to invest in, in our future, mm -hmm. then obviously that money needs to go into investments and not for recurrent expenditure. And I think that that's the big, the, 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 where the debate ought to be. Right. Uh, but we are only at 11% uh, you know, debt service to export earnings. And I tell you, that is the real statistic to look at. Because that is how you pay the debt. All right. The rest of it is uh, a bit of political posturing.